Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm excited to share with you my top five tips for starting your permaculture garden in 2023. Permaculture gardening is a great way to get into creating ecological landscapes that are going to feed you, create space for wildlife to thrive, bring in some pollinator support, bring in some support for endangered insects like the monarch butterfly, and just all around create a multifunctional, beautiful landscape that is both aesthetic, edible, and even maybe a hint of medicinal at the same time. My name is Graham Calder. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and give us a like if you do like what we're sharing. And if you want to see more of this kind of content, check us out on Patreon for some behind the scenes raw footage of what we do in our everyday lives, fermenting, growing mushrooms, building permaculture gardens and whatnot here in the Living P3 Lab. Tip one in creating your permaculture garden is taking a bit of time to plan the garden. I know we're getting excited, getting our seeds ready, but knowing where the new bed is going to go, how big the bed is going to be, how you're going to access it is really crucial. But especially in these times, the changing climate is making it so much more difficult to predict our water, predict our heat. And so you need to design resilience into your garden. Planning your garden is tip number one. And the system elements that we use in planning are water, access, structure, and then making sure you have adequate materials either provided on site or gathered before you start to build. Tip number two is passive irrigation. Gardening is not about watering and weeding. And if you're out there every day, watering, weeding, worrying about the garden, then this is not a beneficial design. This is a design that is going to stress you and has a common fail point of you either not being able to be there when the plants need more water or it just stressing you out and making you less interested in growing food because of that extra work. Now, a properly designed system should have fail safes. It should have its own water reservoir in ground. So it should have access to groundwater tables and not be on dry soil that has no water retention ability. It should have a system that you can set up to be passively irrigating. And it should also be set up so that it does not flood. You don't want just to gather as much water as possible because sometimes we get way more rain than we're anticipating. What we use as irrigating pathways that are leveled to catch the rainwater and let it flood the pathway and then flow through to the next element of the garden, whether it's another path or another garden system. So flow through passive irrigation pathways. We use drip irrigation very often. If I have a rain barrel on site or on my client's property, we'll set up a rain barrel to catch the rainwater, which is very often better than most of our municipal water supply due to the chlorine that's in there or chloramines. We can set up a timer that is going to be irrigating at a specific set schedule at nighttime so we don't get evaporation of water. We get that water going out through a drip irrigation which is below the mulch so you're not losing water to evaporation and we also are going to be setting up elements that will make sure we don't overwater. Ideally, you splurge for the timer that is actually going to have a rain sensor on it. So when it senses that it has rained, it will delay the irrigation of the garden bed to prevent flooding and then also you can set up really completely analog, non-digital, non-active passive systems that are going to help with your irrigation as well. Rock piles are one. I know it sounds trivial, but a pile of rocks is always moist underneath. If there is moisture in the air, the air is going to be condensing that moisture down to the coldest side of the rock. And therefore you get small amounts of wa water being given to the garden. Rocks are also really great for one of the tips later on creating habitat. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So tip number two, setting up passive irrigation systems that mean that you don't have to water the garden and the garden has the moisture it needs to grow when it needs to. All right, tip number three is about structure and planting. The structure of the garden, really crucial, right? How big are your beds? I find so many clients that have lots of these little tiny garden boxes and you can reach from one side of the bed to the other which means that you have twice as much path area as required in that gardening area because you should be able to reach to the middle of the bed rather than to the other side of the bed. I prefer the double reach method and you measure the beds width by the smallest or shortest arms in your area, whether it's your children or your grandparents who are helping you garden. And those shortest arms determine the middle of the bed for maintenance, picking fruits, tomatoes, and whatever else that are growing there. Mandala gardens are a great way to incorporate double reach principles, but in a radial symmetry. It looks gorgeous. It's beautiful for front lawns, beautiful for church yards that want to get rid of the grass and start doing climate positive landscaping, edible landscaping, great for schools, government buildings, anywhere that needs to have a very beautiful facade. The Mandela garden is a great way to make that gorgeous permaculture 
structured garden even better because of the way that it looks. The other thing we can think about is raised container beds that are built on the soil. So these being herb spirals, a structure that gives you multiple different microclimates. So you're not just gardening at the same level or root soil depth. This gives you ability to grow all kinds of different herbs in one small space. Raised container beds for anyone who has back problems or anticipates having back problems or has potentially contaminated soil. So many of the cities that we are growing in have contaminated soil. The cost to testing is so prohibitive. Building up raised beds, but not just boxes on the soil. Actually raised modular mobile container beds is a great tip. We're going to do a whole other video on that container gardening and all the tips involved in how to make the best container gardens. You can make these modular so that if you're not an owner of land, if you're renting backyards or balconies or rooftops, that you can just simply empty the water, empty the soil, and take these systems with you to the next place where you're going to be growing food. The last few elements is multi-sowing and succession planting. Multi-sowing meaning putting more than one seed in your seeding pot, and there's a lot of detail on that. Charles Dowding does an amazing job, so I'm not going to bother going over it. But I recommend you check out and subscribe to Charles Dowding's YouTube channel. It will be in the description below, as well as succession planting, which means, for example, we planted Cherokee purple tomatoes and got something like 11 kilograms of tomatoes in a three week period, which was great. And I have tons of canned tomatoes still sitting over there and, and frozen tomatoes. But my favorite is fresh tomatoes. After the third week, when that Cherokee purple was done, it's fruiting, we didn't have very much left. We had some come on later, but they just weren't as good. And all the other cultivars that we had, we had maybe one plant and it wasn't enough to keep us a good rotation of tomatoes throughout the season. So you want an early cultivar and a mid cultivar and a late cultivar. That's, that's succession planting in a different way. We're not timing our seedlings to go in at different times. We're actually planting cultivars that have different fruiting periods. We want to do this as well with flowers so that we have flowers throughout the garden at all times. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in one of the tips later on. We want to think about the succession planting of those greens and things that are going to be harvested out. Bok choy, 21 days is the earliest harvest. When you're planting your seeds for bok choy or bok choy, even tatsoi, you plant them and a week later plant another batch of seeds. A week later plant another batch of seeds and they go in succession so that when you harvest them a week later there's another round of harvest that's coming. So this is great for spinach, doing for lettuce, for mustard greens, the bok choy, and all kinds of other greens that you're going to be eating frequently throughout the garden. I like this for cilantro because I find my cilantro goes to seed and coriander very quickly, as well as for any of my other herbs that I'm going to be picking, like parsley as well. Parsley is a great one to get established and winterize it with a bunch of straw and, and leaves so that it comes up early next year. If this all seems way too much to be in five tips, I agree, which is why we offer all kinds of in-depth trainings and courses on this. There's a two hour eco gardening course on our website. Do it at your own pace. We also do a fundamentals of permaculture design where we really go into the why and the how and the tools that are used in design. There's a huge amount of content in there to get you kind of next level in your permaculture journey. So if you feel like this is all too much to be squeezed into this little clip. I agree and definitely dive down that rabbit hole. Tip number four is to build soil. It is the base of what we're growing in, but we fail to realize that building soil doesn't mean buying black earth. It doesn't mean adding rock dust. Although when we look at soil, the composition of soil is mineral to the bigger portion, right? We have sand, silt, and clay being the major composition of soil and maybe 5% organic matter. When I was in Cameroon helping a new farm establish in what was a tropical rainforest that they had cut down and used the, lim the lumber for building and so on and so forth. When we were cooking our supper, one pot beans and rice with three logs and you built the fire on the ground level. Well, day two, the fire is like two or three inches down the fire hole. And after the end of the week, we had a foot hole and we had to fill it back in to get the coals up close enough to the pot. And I was just looking at this hole that was being dug by the fire and it just didn't make any sense because what you learn in soil science is that it's mineral. Majority is mineral. This soil was majority organic matter and that's what was burning as we were burning our fire. And that was what could provide for the tropical rainforest that had massive mahoganies and all kinds of amazing lush species of trees that were growing there. So there's a lot more to the organic side, the living side of soil that we need to delve into. And again, that's not something we can do in these five tips, but it is something that we love to do in our more advanced courses. So living soil is crucial. How do you feed living soil is they eat carbon. So either carbon provided by plants that are a permanent green cover crop, 
They're going to provide carbon through the roots or through dry organic matter on the surface, not cedar mulch. Other wood chip mulch is great or straw mulch that has been shredded and has been soaked in water or rained on for a few times if it's not organic because of the pesticide residue. All of these things are great organic matter sources that you can then feed to the living soil or that the living soil will come up and eat. But also you can inoculate with beneficial mushrooms, which we'll talk about in the companion section. It's the last tip. So building soil, meaning using organic matter, we can use the lasagna gardening principles. We can use organic matter mulches, living cover crops, and completely eliminate the tillage of your soil. If you feed the worms and the other isopods in the soil and other rotifers and tillers, they will till the soil five times more by volume than you ever will in a year. And they will do it while increasing aeration, increasing drainage, increasing fertility, and increasing overall health and resilience of your soil ecosystem. Whereas every time we till with a rototiller, we are destroying health, we are destroying drainage, we are increasing compaction, and we are reducing the nutrient availability of soil by killing off the soil life. If you're locked into tillage and you don't know how to get free of it and you're not totally convinced, message us in the comments. We'll do our best to help you on that journey. But when you finally break free from the tillage process of soil preparation, it's really game changer in how it helps your produce as well as the quality and flavor of your fruits and vegetables. When there is nutrient availability in the soil, you get a higher nutrient density in your crops. The final tip is tip number five, companion planting. Now this is a rabbit hole in and of itself, where we're actually preparing an entire two hour course just on companion planting, because when we talk companion planting, yes, carrots love tomatoes, which is a really great book. Roses love garlic is another good book by the same author. Basil loves tomatoes. Those are great companions or plant associations, but this is only one layer of what we call companion planting, planning out your garden so that you have, you know, nitrogen fixers that are not near antibacterial plants like garlic so that they don't kill out the bacteria, fix nitrogen in those plants. Crucial design element. Thinking about plant associations, like one of my favorites is an African marigold, but also a friend of mine told me that it was Mexican marigold. It is about three feet high and about two and a half to three feet wide. It was a bush and at almost all times had 20 to 30 blooms on it. These were all over it. And when you would brush by this plant, it was just a aromatic dominant smell in the garden. It was a nice smell, but it also confuses a lot of the pests that are trying to find the basil and the beans and all kinds of other things that they would prefer to really great support plant, a really great pollinator support. This is one of the things that you want to have, right? So in companion planting, there's many different layers and functions, but we want plants that are going to suppress the weeds. So things that are going to hold their ground. We put a barrier of chives all up, up against all of our garden beds to keep the grasses from crawling in. We put aromatic plants like the, the marigold down so that they help deter pests. We put pest predator attractant plants that are going to attract the predator right beside pest attractant plants like nasturtium, setting up a trap system, or we call them sacrificial plants, where you have the aphids drawn to the nasturtiums. And right beside that, you have your cosmos where the ladybugs are going to hang out and then gorge on the aphids once they land. This is another beneficial companion system that you can set up. You can also set up pollinator support systems. So this means having plants that are providing nectar and pollen for pollinators at all times of the year. And even in early spring, we have crocus that pops up basically when the snow melts, pussy willows that are going to bloom and release a massive amount of pollen, which is food for pollinators. And then you want to set up a blossom calendar, make sure that you have flowers at two flowers, at least at every period during your entire growing season and tiny white flowers like buckwheat or in the lovage parsley family or Yarrow, all of these tiny white flowers are incredibly good for the hoverfly, which is another voracious predator. Then finally, mulch, which is probably my top tip of all of these. If I was to choose any sub tip from my five tips, organic matter in the soil is your best friend. Weed prevention, water retention, fighting pest and disease, because you feed the beneficial organisms who then dominate the soil ecosystem, who then prevent pests and disease and fungal and bacterial outbreaks. But if you provide that, you will also have a new ecosystem that is starting to come into balance. And one of the first ecosystem elements to arrive is going to be slugs and snails. So all of you are going to be hating me. Graham, you don't know what you're talking about. I had a horrible garden this year because of your mouth. Well, we need to get ahead of that succession of the ecosystem into a more diverse living ecosystem. 
and we need to prepare it with pet predator habitat because if you just put down straw, it's a slug haven. And so what are the predators of the slug? You've got the little garden toad. So we want hiding spots for toads, broken pottery pots or hollow logs, a little tiny pond at the bottom of your herb spiral. If you have those rock piles, those are hiding spots for little garter snakes. So the little garden snakes are going to be sunning when you're not in the garden and then hiding underneath. So they feel safe. They don't feel like they have to run from the garden. When you come to visit, they have their own hiding spaces. And finally, the most voracious predator of the slug that I love is the black scarab beetle, Cleopatra, I think in, in French, correct me if I'm wrong, please, in the comments. This is the black beetle that we have in our gardens. This is a really great slug predator and they love woody debris. So a little pile of branches and stumps that you orchestrated in the center of each bed, maybe in the middle of the double reach bed where it's not going to bother anyone, but it's a hub for those black scarab beetles to base their operation of slug patrol and prevent any of the massive damage. And then finally, you can prune the lower leaves of a lot of plants to prevent the slugs from getting up on top. Once you get the predator balance in there, then you won't have very much slugs. I really hope I can find the image for you. There's one Cherokee purple tomato that is about this big. And there was a garden toad that was about that big sitting right beside it. Scared the bejesus out of me and my son as we were going to pick because he was just sitting there waiting underneath big leaf for us to leave so that he could go about his business cleaning up slugs. Those are my top five tips for how to get your permaculture garden growing this year and get the most out of your small growing space, get the best flavor and nutrient density out of those crops with the least amount of watering, weeding, and other labor involved. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to hear more, please join our Patreons, $3 a month. And you get to join us in our monthly fireside chat where we go into next level rabbit hole conversations about this material. And I post raw unedited videos as often as I can just on the mushroom farm, the green wall behind me and all the different things that we are working on in our easier permaculture living labs.